In Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, a new nuclear family lives in the old Myers house. Well, you know, it isn't exactly the Myers house, but it's closer than the monstrosity they used in Halloween 5. The parents are named John and Deborah Strode, the aunt and uncle of Laurie Strode from Halloween 1, who are named after the producers of that original movie, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. For added authenticity, John Strode's first line in the movie sounds exactly like something John Carpenter would have said after making Halloween 2. Enough! This Michael Myers! While Carpenter and Hill did date for a few years in the late 70s while they made Halloween, the only child their relationship birthed in real life was one of the top 10 most lucrative horror franchises of all time. The sixth entry of this franchise would feature many more connections to the 1978 original as well as many other surprising secrets. To learn the meaning behind this pumpkin and more, stick around to the end of this video. Thank you for riding the Halloween Express. The next stop is Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. When we pull into the station, you'll exit to the left on the Producer's Cut platform. Yeah, I decided to use the infamous Producer's Cut as the basis for this episode of Things You Missed, but I will still mention one easter egg that can only be found in the theatrical cut. As with all the previous Halloween films we've passed through on this journey, I will once again be joined by my co-conductor, Jimmy Champagne. So Zach and I got these shirts made from Halloween 6 and we realized that it had a not friendly YouTube word on it. So I spent all this time taping it out and then I realized this is my recording angle. It's a little known fact that the producer's cut of my last name has a G in it. Yeah, I might need to take that joke out of the CZ cut of this video. I'll ask that everybody please take their seats and turn your attention to the windows as we'll be running through some more things you missed. <laughs> As I mentioned, the parent characters in Halloween 6 pay homage to the Carpenter Hill duo, who went on to collaborate on many more films together, one of which is the 1980 movie The Fog, which is also referenced here in Curse. Roll it. This is the famous Tim Strode stomach pounder. You down for the challenge? If you've seen The Fog, the line might sound very familiar. Yes, ma'am. Mom, can I have a stomach pounder and a Coke? In 1982, Carpenter and Hill produced Halloween 3, which is also honored here. The woman who runs the boarding house next door to the Myers house goes by the name of Mrs. Blankenship, the same name as the woman that Mr. Grimbridge was supposed to have had dinner with shortly before his disappearance in Season of the Witch. October 21st, dinner with Minnie. Minnie Blankenship, he never showed up. The Curse of Michael Myers begins as we see an older Jamie Lloyd, the little girl from Halloween 4 and Halloween 5, escaping from Smith's Grove Sanitarium. We don't know that it's Smith's Grove yet, but if you pause the movie right here, you can see that it's actually a Smith's Grove van chasing Jamie right before it forces her off the road. But when we do officially find out later on, it makes some nice parallels to the previous movies. In Halloween and Halloween 4, Michael Myers is the one to escape Smith's Grove on a rainy October 30th night. And now it's Jamie, the girl once poised to be his successor. She even steals a car just as Michael did after both of his escapes. There's also this very dark detail in the producer's cut of Halloween 6 that implies that Michael Myers is the father of Jamie Lloyd's child. Or as I learned to call him in Cinemassacre's Monster Madness, Uncle Dad. And you guys aren't gonna believe this, but it gets even darker from there. So in this movie, Jamie is played by an actress named JC Brandy, who was 20 years old at the time. But since Jamie was eight years old in Halloween 4, and this one takes place in 1995, that would mean she's around 15 years old when she delivers her baby, and that is just dark and gross. In the theatrical cut, they added this shot of a bunch of embryos to imply that Steven is a test tube baby, just to make it a little less disturbing for the general movie-going audience. But then, in turn, they also made it more more disturbing for religious moviegoers, so yeah, it's like six in one hand, half dozen in the other, you're gonna offend someone with a plot point like that. On a lighter note, there's a weird coincidence with this trilogy of Halloween movies and the way that they're subtitled. So the first one is called Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, the fifth one is called Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, and the sixth one is called Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. And weirdly enough, there's another film franchise that used the same subtitles for its fourth, sixth, and eighth movies, and that franchise is The Pink Panther, yes. Pink Panther 4 is called The Return of the Pink Panther, Pink Panther 6 is called The Revenge of the Pink Panther, and Pink Panther 8 is called The Curse of the Pink Panther. Each of those Pink Panther movies came out before its Halloween counterpart, and on top of that, there was a Pink Panther remake in 2006, one year before Halloween's remake in 2007, and that remake had a sequel, The Pink Panther 2, in 2009, just six months before the Halloween remake sequel, Halloween 2. But Pink Panther comparisons aside, Curse of Michael Myers features Michael coming back to Haddonfield under the orders of the mysterious Cult of Thorn to steal Jamie Lloyd's baby and sacrifice his half-cousin to pass his curse onto the child. 
With the franchise branching away from the lore of the earlier movies, this film tries to get back to basics by tying the modern Michael Myers back into the Celtic mythology that backed Halloween 2 and Halloween 3. Director Joe Chappelle even brought back Donald Pleasance's blatant mispronunciation of the Gaelic festival Samhain when Tommy Doyle explains it all to Kara Strode. According to Celtic legend, one child from each tribe was chosen to be inflicted with the curse of Thorn to offer the blood sacrifices of its next of kin on the night of Samhain. Halloween. The sacrifice of one family meant sparing the lives of an entire tribe. Samhain was explained in Halloween 2 to be the source of Michael's benevolent evil, and in Halloween 3, the motivation for Connell Cochran's terrifying Halloween plot. Curse takes the involvement of the holiday one step further by connecting it to these ancient runes and explaining that the dates of Michael's attacks are determined by the appearance of the Thorn constellation. And as Tommy explains this, his face is way too close to Kara's hair. I guess he and Loomis have that in common. Are you alright? Yeah, that definitely is a weird thing that keeps happening. Also, every time I watch this part about the runes now, I'm just gonna see the word simp right there. Thanks, internet. A good amount of people are just doing the reasonable thing and just making jokes. Anyways, at the end of Jamie's escape from Smith's Grove, she crashes into a pumpkin patch at a barn, a very similar location to where she gave Michael the slip in Halloween 5. Only this time, Jamie is not so lucky. Throughout this mini-series of Halloween franchise Things You Missed episodes, Jimmy and I have attempted to point out all of the lesser-known callbacks, the tributes, the homages to the original Halloween. Despite everything we've already brought up in the first five movies, this sixth entry may be the most derivative of all. But there is another massively iconic horror movie that Curse of Michael Myers feels very influenced by, and that is Stanley Kubrick's 1980 masterpiece, The Shining. It just so happens that your hosts today are the perfect people to be pointing out these connections because I have a channel that's practically dedicated to Halloween and Zach never misses a reference to The Shining. Zach wrote that joke to say he never seems to miss a reference to The Shining, but I'm just gonna come out and tell you guys he never misses one. It's, it's a fact. So if you're somehow unfamiliar with The Shining, one, what are you doing with your life? And two, here's what you need to know. A former teacher named Jack Torrance moves his family into an isolated hotel for the winter so he can take a job as the hotel's winter caretaker. His son Danny has a psychic and clairvoyant ability known as the Shine, allowing him to see the ghosts of the hotel's past. After being shut in long enough, the ghosts get to Jack, causing him to go crazy and chase his family with an axe. Halloween is an unlikely franchise to do The Shining because Michael Myers is a slasher villain and The Shining is a psychological horror movie, but if you keep any franchise going long enough, you're bound to try something new. The Shining connection all starts with Kara's son, Danny. Not only does he share a name with Danny Torrance from The Shining, but he's a young boy with a bowl cut and psychic voices in his head. Danny Strode hears the voice of Dr. Wynn, who encourages him to kill for Michael Myers, while Danny Torrance hears Tony, his imaginary friend who warns him about the dangers posed by his shine. Danny Strode even has visions just like Danny Torrance does. About halfway through the movie, Dr. Loomis tries to warn the Strodes that Michael Myers is gonna come for them. He does so by just straight up walking into their house. This dude is out of control. He could have just waited by the front door for them to come home. After warning Deborah about this danger, she wants to get the kids out of Haddonfield. I'm getting the children out of here, at least until I know what's going on. John, I want you to come with us. This is basically beat for beat the same conversation that Wendy Torrance has with her husband in The Shining when she tries to suggest that her Danny should be driven to a doctor in town for his well-being. I think maybe he should be taken to a doctor. You think maybe he should be taken to a doctor? <laughs> Earlier, I talked about the character John Strode being named after John Carpenter, but perhaps there is a second meaning here as well. He seems to represent Jack Torrance in this story whose real name in the Shining novel is John Torrance. I first realized the similarity between these characters when I saw John Strode's first reaction to his wife's hysteria. You've lost it now, you know that, Deborah? You've just lost it. It's very similar to Jack's response to Wendy's claim that someone is with them in the hotel. Are you out of your f***ing <laughs> mind? They're both alcoholic, abusive father figures. John Strode even drinks Jack Daniels Tennessee whiskey, the very same beverage selected by Jack in the Shining. Heck, they even used the exact same line at one point. Come out, come out. Wherever you are. Come out, come out, wherever you are. The way Michael Myers approaches Deborah, slowly as her back is turned, is very similar to how Jack approaches Wendy as she's reading through the stacks of paper on the typewriter. There's no sudden movement or jump scare, just the looming realization that the character is not alone. 
Michael eventually takes her out with an axe, a weapon that he's never used before, and at the time of making this video, has never used since. Check me on that, Jimmy. Yeah, that is the only time Michael Myers uses an axe. I'm sure it's no coincidence that he wields Jack Torrance's main weapon of choice. Both Dannys go into these hypnotic trances later in the movie, and both of their mothers have a similar reaction at the first sight of danger. Danny, run! Danny, Remember how I said I'd be using one thing from Halloween 6's theatrical cut? Well, the room that Kara escapes from in the sanitarium is room 237, the same number as the most haunted room in the Overlook Hotel in The Shining. All right, I've had my fun. I'm gonna throw it over to Jimmy Champagne to talk about all of the Halloween 1 connections. Thanks, Zach. I'll just start at the beginning of the movie and move on from there. When Jamie is escaping the asylum, a woman who helps her out gets lifted up and impaled on this thorn-like object on the wall, which is very similar to how Michael took out Bob Sims back in 78, especially how he just stands there and admires his work. Also, Bob Sims has the same last name as Barry Sims, the radio show host in Six, although I don't think they're related. It doesn't seem like Barry would be so exploitative of Haddonfield and Michael Myers if he had a family member get whacked in the original Rampage. That night when Tommy Doyle logs on to the Project Michael Myers website, Michael Myers' face flashes on the screen in the exact same way that he appeared out of the dark at the top of the Doyle staircase back in 1978. If this came out today, there would be a whole Project Michael Myers ARG leading up to the release of the movie. Yeah, I hope you're paying attention, Nightmind. Anyway, we're reintroduced to Dr. Terrence Wynn, who appeared as a young administrator at Smith's Grove back in the first movie. After 32 years, guess who is finally relinquishing his duties as chief administrator of Smith's Grove? No, it's not the same actor, but many people don't realize that this is a character who was featured in the first movie, and it's definitely not their fault because he was only in like two shots. And of course, the other Halloween 1 character who came back in a big way was Tommy Doyle. He's always staring out his window. Last night I caught him watching me. Tommy Doyle staring out a window? I guess some things never change. There's even a moment where young Danny sees Michael Myers across the way from Tommy's window, just like young Tommy did in the first movie. Then there's the Haddonfield bus terminal where we hear this announcement. Bus 34 from Peoria, Russellville, and Gardner, with through service to Chicago, Illinois, will be arriving in five minutes. But Russellville is one of the nearby towns that was mentioned in Halloween's 1 and 2. I remember over in Russellville. We've still got a bunch more to cover like Halloween 1 connections, crew reference Easter eggs, and this one single pumpkin. But Zach is giving me the eye right now, so I think we're supposed to take a break and come right back with even more things you missed. In our previous episodes, we talked about how Michael always seems to appear in tandem with these bedsheets, which we theorized is related to his tendency to go after teenagers like his sister Judith, who are always focused on trying to go to bed with one another. At this point, I think the meaning is lost, and the bedsheets are just more of a running gag. We see them hanging up outside as Deborah is chased out of the house, and Mr. Strode later finds one of the sheets covered in red in the washing machine. And this one isn't technically a bedsheet, but Michael notably appears behind a curtain as Mrs. Blankenship is telling Michael's backstory. You can only spot him as the lightning is striking outside. Remember how in the original, bullies harass Tommy and make him fall on his pumpkin? Well in Curse, something very similar happens to Danny, who is startled and drops his pumpkin on the ground, only this time, Tommy's the one who causes it. Sorry. At this point, Barry Sims is well into his Halloween night radio broadcast from Haddonfield. And during a commercial break, Michael takes him out inside of a vehicle in a very similar scene to how we see Annie die in the first Halloween movie. Meanwhile, we check in on Beth and her boyfriend, Tim, as she tells the story of Michael's first attack back in 1963 while walking up the same stairs that Judith Myers and her boyfriend walked up that very night. Then they sleep together on the same bed, or at least in the same bedroom where Judith became Michael Myers' first ever victim. After getting busy upstairs, Tim jumps in the shower, and Michael hands him a towel, pretending to be Beth. This is something that seems to happen once in each movie. Michael pretended to be Bob under the ghost costume to catch Linda off guard in 1, he pretended to be Bud to get close to Karen in the hot tub in 2, he poses as Deputy Logan to sneak up on Kelly in 4, and he takes the wheel of Mikey's car in costume to pick up Tina in 5. And finally, when Kara jumps out a window to escape Michael Myers and the Cult of Thorn, we see her lying face down on the ground just like Michael did at the end of Halloween 1978. Now being the former Illinois boy that I am, I've always been interested in Haddonfield's location in the state. Haddonfield is not a real place, but we've seen it placed all over the prairie state, including south of Hardin County, which is way at the bottom, in Warren County, which is way to the west, and in Livingston County in the northeast, closer to Lake Michigan. In Halloween 6, we get more of an exact map placement thanks to the bus 
map shown right here. The order of these stops is pretty accurate, with the exception of Bloomington and Funks Grove being switched. Using this map places Haddonfield right around where the village of Odell is in real life, which is part of Livingston County. I would say that this is a nice attention to detail, but a newspaper later in the movie still features Haddonfield news in the Warren County Gazette. As I've mentioned before, Haddonfield is supposed to be more of an everytown USA sort of place, so the actual location isn't really that important, but it can still be fun to analyze this map. By the way, when we first see the bus station, there's a sign at the desk that says back in 20. This is obviously a reference to the franchise coming back for Halloween Kills, which was supposed to come out in 2020, but was delayed one year due to the COVID-19 outbreak. <sighs> Shut up, Zach. I'm guessing that joke will not be in the Jimmy Champagne cut. Speaking of locations though, a whole bunch of the Thorn trilogy was shot in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we see a reference to this in a magazine on John's desk that's opened up to Salt Lake City real estate listings. There's also one crew reference Easter egg that I was able to spot in the form of a sticky note posted by the Strode's phone. It lists the number for Dr. Duane which is likely a nod to Dwayne Manwiller, the first assistant camera on Halloween 6. While we're talking about the production side of things, the film was distributed by Dimension Films, which is part of the production company Miramax. Dimension was also responsible for other high-profile horror franchises such as Hellraiser, and it seems they really wanted to push it at the time. According to Rivers of Gru, $1 million was taken out of the budget for Curse of Michael Myers and given to Hellraiser Bloodline, which would come out the next year. In addition to that, Halloween 6's director, Joe Chappelle, had to come and finish directing Bloodline uncredited after the original director quits. So it comes as no surprise that they tried to promote the new Hellraiser movie by putting this pinhead-inspired jack-o'-lantern on the front porch. There are actually quite a few additional horror movie references. Before Michael Myers is first introduced in this one, we see his shadow on a staircase, just like the iconic scene from the 1922 vampire flick Nosferatu. I think you probably already realize Beth and Tim's costumes are supposed to be Frankenstein's monster and Bride of Frankenstein, but I'm mentioning it here just in case. Later on, when Tommy takes Kara upstairs to his boarding room, you'll notice Mrs. Blankenship watching Phantom of the Opera, a movie with a very famous unmasking scene, perhaps a clue about Dr. Loomis's unmasking of Dr. Wynn at the end of this cut. Kids, my dear Deborah, what's ruining this country? Everywhere you go, it's the same damn thing. There's no goddamn respect. He's talking about millennials. There are just a couple of other miscellaneous items that I want to point out. When Barry is broadcasting his radio show the day before Halloween, Jamie calls in and claims that Michael is back, and he responds by saying that it seems like every loony in the state is calling tonight. What's the deal here? Did radio shows not screen their callers in the 90s? In any event, I do love the use of 90s slang to foreshadow the arrival of Michael Myers. Tonight's gonna be killer. Finally, there's this shot that I found kind of cool. When Carrie gets back home to the Myers house, you see the coat rack way in the background, which is weird because why would you put a coat rack upstairs? But it's dressed to almost resemble the appearance of Dr. Wynn with the trench coat and the long brim hat. It seems this was maybe supposed to be a bit of a psychological trick on the audience. Like The Shining Parallels, another example of this Halloween having a little bit more of an affinity for psychological horror than the others. Whether you prefer the producer's cut, where Loomis discovers that Michael's escaped and sees the thorn symbol appear on his own arm, or the theatrical cut where Michael turns on the colt and then gets drugged and beat up by Tommy and Kara, this is where we reach the end of the line on the Halloween Express. For connections to the 20-year timeline, including destinations like Halloween H2O and Halloween Resurrection, go back to Halloween 2, where our linked terminal will be opening in fall 2022. In the meantime, make sure you thank Jimmy Champagne for joining us on this entire journey and sharing his expertise on all things Halloween. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe to Zach's channel. I know that he won't say it himself, but there is a ton of work that goes into each and every one of these videos, and he totally deserves your support. So join us next year, yes, I said next year, for new Things You Missed episodes on the rest of the Halloween franchise. Until then, I've got a lot of other horror topics to cover. Make sure you subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I will see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.